guess I will take the, I'll take the mic. Uh, good morning. Good morning. In, uh, in Kenya, since we have some Kenyans in the audience, uh, we uh, come on in. Uh, we say Oyaore, which translates to the sky has opened, which I have always thought is a very extremely philosophical way of saying good morning, right? The sky has opened. Um, so the sky has opened on Saturday, the last day of this wild ride. And um, we're here to, um, to think about that, you know, uh, modes of, um, well, I'm going to go to my, my prepared remarks because I'm still getting fully caffeinated. Um, before we convene, I, I need to thank so many people, beginning with Yorinda, uh, for the invitation to me to organize the study day and for the guidance as I put together my ideas and uh, the group for today's presentations. I also need to thank Yort uh, for the sort of lo logistical wizardry that these days probably should be considered an art form. <laughs> and uh, to uh, Nikos, uh, who is officially titled our host, which I love, that's a title. Uh, makes me feel like a parasite, but I guess that's a good relation to be in. Seriously, every worthwhile endeavor, uh, the effort, like, like every uh, worthwhile endeavor, the effort to get us all here today um, from our many flung locations on the globe, uh, including, but not only, uh, the United States of America, uh, us. Um, but I should say was, um, uh, like any such endeavor, uh, the, the, the gathering is itself experimental uh, in, the, in the sense that each new venture uh, such as this is an experiment in trust. When I got the invitation to take part in this platform, I hope Yorinda doesn't mind me telling you, the first thing I did was call up uh, <laughs> Rizvana Radley and Jack Halberstam, uh, uh, who were guest curators from last year, and I asked, you know, is the Studium Generale Rietveld Academy? Is this for real? Um, and they assured me it was real. <laughs> last year's theme uh, was hapticality, and it's still uh, resonating this year. So you might say um, that one of my questions was whether or not the conveners of this platform had the right touch, right? Uh, both Rizvana and Jack assured me they did, and they both singled out Yorinda for specific praise. As the last couple days have shown, and I've been privileged to be here for part, although sadly not all of it, uh, holding on to the utopian remnant is not always easy to do in times such as these, uh, in which the forces of reaction are constantly gathering to surprise us when we least expect them. It might, so it might sound cautious, but I believe that in order to experiment wildly, uh, we need trusted comrades to do this with, right? Uh, we do not need these chains of connection and mutual aid in order to be safe. I believe that we all know safe space is a bit of a fantasy. But we need these connections in order to be brave, right? Because brave space is a goal I think we can work toward. I'm just going to continue. This is all just thank yous, right? Uh, I need to thank Tina Kemp. Uh, who I'll introduce again later in the day for so generously and continuously including me over the years in her own capacious scenes of black feminist study on two continents and counting. Quiet as, it kept, quiet as it's kept, and the word is getting out, in addition to being among our most foremost critical theorists of visual culture and of the archive of the black diaspora, Tina Kemp is the hidden dynamo behind some of the most effective black feminist working groups, and I, for one, have been taking notes. I was so glad to be part of the Sojourners Project that she and Saidiya Hartman brought to Paris uh, this past fall, um, a gathering from which another one of our number, uh, the architectural historian Mabel Wilson, coined the name Ninjas in Paris. So I'll borrow that if I may and welcome you here today to Ninjas in Amsterdam. Can we play the first uh, video? It was 6 a.m. at Harare Airport, and we were waiting for Maracera to appear. It was a relief to see him step onto the tarmac. He was late. We'd been waiting for three days, and I was anxious about how he was feeling. 
There had been a delay in issuing his travel document to the High Commission in London, and this had triggered an extreme reaction, relayed in fraught phone calls. He thought there was a plot of some kind against him. He had torn up his airline ticket and refused to leave. Then the travel document was issued, and he decided to come. Son of the soil, kinda. You're noble. Hey, brighter. This is really good, you yeah. know. I've just arrived actually. Yeah. God. Chris, how are you? I'm afraid um, um uh, we had um, a bit of a uh, hustle in London. Um, um but um, I'm here anyway. And frankly, I think uh, Wilson Catillo, also a writer, whom Marachera had known in exile. I don't know. This is Zimbabwe, for God's sake. Hey, look, I'm back home. And uh, Zimbabwe Airport. I'm, I'm really back home. I... I'll say, hey, look. The first time in eight years. In eight years. Yeah, thanks. Oh, the back one. Yeah, good. I'll just carry this my jetty free goods. Okay. Um, and, uh, hey, look. It's really great to be in Zimbabwe. God. Uh, he was not going to come down here. I was simply fed up. I thought that you had set me up. What do you mean? Well, simply that um, um, you had really set me up to get arrested um, uh, here in Zimbabwe because I was going to have to travel without a passport, like I was arrested in West Berlin. And, um, I mean, that's the sort of thing I was thinking, uh, you know, up there, because, you see, you and Ron could have taken care of uh, um, all the um, um, uh, passport and travel document things. I, I, I think we can get into that later. I, I, I'm no, that was the problem. So, you know, we arrive too early and we depart too soon is the saying, right? And um, I'm showing this brief video which circulates on YouTube from the uh, novelist Dambuzo Marechera, uh, author of most famously Black Sunshine, a powerful decolonial black novel that's looking at the, um, uh, th that, that provides a almost hallucinatory investigation into the conditions of black movement uh, within and beyond uh, the nation state. And um, it was from Marachera's writings that in the discussions around the uh, curation of today that we came upon the phrase from one of his sh short stories, dark as the door to a dream. And I'm just going to say a little bit about this idea um, because there was a poesis in black movement, a, a poetics, if you will, and um, we invoke Marachera's vision uh, as, we, uh, as we think about uh, the day ahead of us. Black is, black ain't goes to famous sermon from the opening pages of Invisible Man. Black will get you, its less well-known line continues black will leave you alone. I think about these lines whenever I'm working to produce public black dialogues under conditions of structural anti-blackness and pervasive surveillance. The dialectical movement of this idea that blackness is both itself and something else is simple but enduring. This inner motion of the idea is a perpetual reminder, reminder to us all not to think of blackness as something to be possessed but rather as something that possesses us. I think we cannot now take it for granted, if ever we could, that a feminist scene of black study, such as today is being attempted, can simply take time and place in the art world or in higher education. An event that seeks to center, as the works of Tiana Nekia McLaughlin and Naima Ramos Chapman both do in their astonishing work in film and video, which we will see and discuss later today, visions of black genders and sexualities that refuse to conform are not simply able to appear on command or for entertainment. 
to other artists who are adjacent to our proceedings today, as we say, are here in spirit, um, our Onyx, Anastasis, and Geo Wyeth. We'll be looking at their work, The Moth, and Muck Studies uh, later in the day. Bringing visual work from the African diaspora and from a planetary idea of blackness to a historic center of European commerce and colonialism, such as Amsterdam, is a risk to be sure. But the dialogues we have structured today between artists and scholarly interlocutors, we hope, will model how an informed conversation, informed conversation about race, gender, and sexuality can emerge in even the least probable of spaces. Every year, every, every month, it seems, uh, the barriers to our movement grow higher. We see this in the, um, maybe you can take the image off the screen. Uh, we see this in both the ecstasy of homecoming and the anxiety that follows, right? The anxiety of arrival. Uh, to be sure, those barriers fall unevenly, the barriers to movement, depending on our passports and other indices of privilege, depending on which nations, diasporas, and religions can claim us for their own. And yet the possibility of black movement and of black movements is never simply an effect of capitalist globalization or individual cosmopolitan privilege. To the contrary, the very possibility of our presence is premised on the insurgent movement of people out of war zones and extractive zones, movement that cannot really be parsed into the legalistic distinction between economic and political flight. The real movement of the people over the face of the world, which is actually revolutionary in its import and effect, confronts the capitalist dream world with today with something like its nightmare doppelganger. As we remain caught in the interstices of dream world and catastrophe, precious opportunities for study such as this today can never simply be taken for granted. I know the students here today do not take this opportunity for granted, and we are all eager to hear your voices in this room uh, towards the end of the day. We're going to stage a model where we're going to ask you to hold your questions, sit with them, bring together a synthesis of responses to the variety of things that you're going to see, and then participate in a dialogue at the end. Today is a dream come true for me in another sense. When I began to work 10 years ago on a book that I had just completed, it was because I had awoken one morning with a strange word, Afrofabulation, bouncing around my head. I must have been reading and thinking about Afrofuturism the night before, and had been mentally rehearsing the critical debates that had been instigated by that term's coinage back in the 1990s. Afrofuturism had come to mean many things, and in a text like Kojo Eshun's More Brilliant Than the Sun, its possibilities seemed almost infinite. But used as a shorthand or cliche, Afrofuturism also proved somewhat hampering. Indeed, if we historicize the emergence of Afrofuturist discourse, we might see it occurring alongside the rise of internet culture, the dot-com bu bubble, and disruptive innovations of Silicon Valley. This discourse of capitalist futures in the 1990s was driven by fantasies of perpetual technological breakthrough leading up to the singularity of artificial intelligence as a kind of secular millennium. Given this dominant ideology, it does not come as a surprise that black aesthetics would swerve away from a simple future or futurity even as we continue to investigate other darker futures. Afrofabulation, that is to say, began as a sort of dream variation on Afrofuturism, inspired above all by the call Saidiya Hartman made to critically fabulate in the face of the erasures of history. Since I am a teacher, I will put this in pedagogical terms. Forgive me. For the past decade in my classroom, I have always paired readings of Afrofuturism with Hartman's essay, Venus in Two Acts. And this pairing has enabled me to show students how Octavia Butler's novel Kindred is a key inspiration to critical fabulation. Kindred, some of us know, concerns a modern day African American woman who is drawn back by involuntary and inexplicable forces into the timeline of her own family history. In her own past, Dana confronts her own enslavement alongside her ancestors 
and comes to discover that she must save a white male slave-holding ancestor in order to preserve the possibility of her own future. Although Butler is regularly tagged as a science fiction writer, Kindred is not easily defined in genre terms. The psychological horror in her novel could as easily be compared to the recent films of Jordan Peele, which, is per which, which perhaps owe a debt to Butler's bleak and unforgiving vision of the afterlives of slavery. Yorinda has been reminding us each day that critical fabulation, if it is anything at all, is a way of insisting upon the engendering of modernity in the matrix of Atlantic slavery. We, we, we so insist not in order to prioritize the African diaspora above all others, but rather, if I may borrow and adapt here from Tina Kant, in order to pursue black feminist study as a counter intuition of modernity. <clears throat> in listening to images, Kant extends her field reshaping investigations into the archives of diaspora to posit a resonance of the black image that resists what we could call the violence of representation. In the face of this pervasive surveillance, policing, and denigration of the black image, Camp calls attention to visual resonance, and today we will hear more, I think, about how this method can be brought to bear in theorizing the emergence of a black gaze on the weltering world of violent and sensational images. It may seem ironic that some of us who are so obsessed with the moving image and the still image are so suspicious of representation, and I know this is a, a big question, probably as big as black is black ain't, right? Um, but as we know from the very distinctive image-making practices of Luke Willis Thompson, of Fiona Nakia McLaughlin, and Naima Ramos Chapman, each working from different locations in the settler colonial world, blackness arises out of a confrontation with white supremacy, a continuous and ongoing confrontation with white supremacy in both its spectacular and its mundane forms. Today, we think of how we are adjacent to each other in this, increasingly entangled in each other's diasporas, in each other's fates, as we come together to listen to some of the music of other worlds, to borrow a term from the speaker I'm about to introduce. So with this, I will introduce our first speaker, my partner in crime, <laughs> Professor Jana Brown, whose speculative histories of black women performers circulating internationally in the late 19th and early 20th century has been critical for a generation of scholars in America and beyond. After more than a decade teaching in California at the University of California, Riverside, Brown moved to New York to become professor of media studies at the Pratt Institute, which I understand is the second hippest art school in the world, <laughs> after the Reitfeld Academy, of course. <laughs> after Professor Brown's talk, we will have a break, and then we'll go into the first of the dialogues, a public conversation between Brown and Naima Ramos Chapman. Again, I'll introduce them both when we reconvene, but I'll say now, uh, Ramos Chapman is an interdisciplinary artist and a filmmaker based in Brooklyn. I will um, now turn the uh, uh, podium over to uh, 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 Jana Brown, and she will launch our platform with a preview of her new project entitled Black Utopias, which as I mentioned is listening for the resonance of the music from other worlds. And her title is A Fierce Organicism Ecologies of Enmeshment in Contemporary Art. Please join me in welcoming Jana Brown. <laughs> 